good evening to our distinguished speakers chairs and audience in different parts of the world this is the fourth session in our anniversary edition of uh, webinars and today we have two great speakers with us who are going to enlighten us through their lectures the first speaker for today is a very well known giant and icon in the field of spine surgery in china and it is my great honor and privilege to introduce you to professor fengzhen jian Professor Jian is the Vice Chairman, Department of Neurosurgery and Director of Neurospine Center, Suanwu Hospital, Capital Medical University, China, China International Neuroscience Institute, Beijing. As I said, he is an expert in spine surgery. He has also held many administrative positions in various societies. He was the President of the Spine Committee of the Chinese Association of Neurological Surgeons till 2017. He was the Executive Committee Member of the Asia Pacific Cervical Spine Society and AO Spine China. He was also the AO Spine Education Officer till 2020. He is a noted author with several publications in various peer-reviewed journals. We are extremely thankful to Professor Feng Zheng Jian for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars. Today he is going to talk about the plan to axial dislocation with basilar invagination recommendations and controversies. The second speaker for today is our honored guest from USA, Professor Kenan Arnautovic. Professor Arnautovic will be joining us soon, and we will skip his introduction after he joins. The chair for the first session of today is a world-renowned neurosurgeon from India. He is called the World Guru of Craniovertebral Junction, a title conferred upon him by Professor Michael Fellings, and he is none other than Professor Atul Goel. Professor Goel is credited for his accomplishment of changing the concept of craniovertebral junction surgery forever after he described his technique of atlanta axial fixation. Professor Goel was the past president of the Neurological Society of India. He is a professor and head of the department of said GS Medical College and KM Hospital, Mumbai. He is an orator par excellence and a very influential teacher and mentor to several young neurosurgeons around the world. His scholarly art articles translate into hundreds of original articles in various peer-reviewed journals and book chapters. He is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Craniovertebral Junction and Spine. And we are extremely honored and thankful to Professor Guel for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Jian. The chair for the second session for today is Professor Akihide Kondo. Professor Kondo is the chairman and professor department of neurosurgery at prestigious Juntendo University, Tokyo, Japan. Professor Kondo is an expert in the management of brain tumors and is a very prominent figure in the Japanese Neurosurgical Society. He has published several manuscripts in this regard in various internationally peer-reviewed journals. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the second session of this webinar today. A warm welcome to our distinguished faculties, especially Professor Rishnayar and Dr. Abhidasha and all others who have joined as panelists for this webinar. A special welcome to Dr. C. C. Ao Yang, who is an attending neurosurgeon at the Huashan Hospital, Fudan University, Shanghai, China, who has joined us as a co-host. This is a new initiative adopted by our president, Professor Yoko Kato, to promote women in neurosurgery in Asia. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President Professor Yoko Kata, I would like to welcome everybody to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to Professor Atul Goel. Welcome to all of you. Craniovertebral junction surgery is difficult. It is dangerous. It is highly result-oriented. It has to be learned, it has to be perfected, and you have to do it fantastically. So I am having a, my great pleasure to welcome my dear friend for a long time, Professor Zia from Beijing. I visited him recently. He and his younger colleague, Dr. Zian Chen, are doing fantastic work on craniovertebral junction, not only in China, but in the entire world. And I know they are doing some other rest of the spine work also very fantastically. So it will be a great honor to hear him talk. Welcome to you, Professor Zia, my dear friend. Okay, it's uh, my great honor to be here. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So this evening, I am uh, going to talk about the Atlanta exit dislocation, uh, especially those with baseline imagination. Uh, even though we have uh, uh, we have gotten great uh, advances in recent in, in recent years, but controversies still exist in the in the management of, of Atlanta exit dislocation and the basement of the nation. So uh, in this uh, lecture, I'd like to present our recommendations based on experience from uh, Xiangwu Hospital and uh, from the uh, literature. Uh, 
So uh, these are uh, typical, um, typical MR images of uh, tensor axial dislocation resulting in the anterior compression of the uh, spinal cord and uh, medulla oblongata. So from a CT scan, we can see the Here is a patient of uh, uh, general atlantal axial di dislocation. And in patients of uh, basal imagination, here we can see the C1 is assimilated, or C1 occipitalization. So nowadays, our, uh, the aim of treatment is to reduce the dislocation and uh, then uh, decompress the spinal cord. So in nowadays, uh, uh, transoral odontoid, odontoidectomy is not the first choice of the treatment. So the first the, the strategy uh, changed totally in, re in recent in recent two decades. Uh, so the, the the first choice is to reduce the dislocation. So. This is very clear and there's no uh, debate. So, but for the treatment of uh, Atlanta exit, uh, for the Atlanta exit dis dislocation, we have to focus on the facet joint because, because talking about the at an axial dislocation, we mean the distance between C1 anterior arch and uh, odontoid, uh, the, the distance increased. But when we talk about the fixation or treatment of the atlanta axial dislocation, we have to focus on the uh, facet joints because we, because we usually put the screw in C1, C2, uh, or occiput. So we have to understand very clear the anatomy of the region, especially the facet joints. Now we can see from the CT reconstruction from here, uh, this is a condyle, and this is a C1 lateral mass, and this, this is C2, uh, C1 lateral, uh, the condyle, C1 lateral mass, and C2. But in patients of basal invagination, we cannot see any more the condyle and C1 lateral mass. Well, so we cannot see them. We cannot see them anymore. So instead, the, C the condyle and the C1 lateral mass fuse together and, be uh, and they become a very irregular anatomy. We, uh, for the convenience of its exchange, we still uh, name, we still call this structure, this structure, uh, C1 lateral mass, only for the convenience of uh, exchange and to, to talk. Uh, so we have to know very, uh, very well before the surgery, the anatomical change of the, of the region, especially in patients of basal imagination. Additionally, we know in norm uh, normally the vertebral arch passes above the C1 arch. Uh, but, in, but, but in normal people, in the, especially in the East Asian countries like China, Japan, and Korea, even the normal people, the incidence of abnormal cause of vertebral artery is about four to six percent. And the incidence in uh, Europe and the US is much lower, usually less than one percent. But in East, uh, but in East Asia countries, it's very high. Especially in patients of basal imagination, the abnormal cause of vertebral artery usually is over 40, uh, 40 hundred. So during, the, during surgery, during fixation of C1, C2, 
we have to pay special attention to the vertebral artery, especially during the, during the exposure of facet joints. Here we can see the abnormal course of vertebral artery. Additionally, we also have to see preoperatively very well if there's a high riding of the vertebral artery in C2, because normally it is about uh, seven, 17 to 22% of a vertebral artery high riding. Uh, and the impatience of basal ventilation is much higher. So for, uh, for these reasons, the challenge for the treatment of the atlanta axial dislocation uh, with basal ventilation is much higher than the, uh, than the general atlanta axial dislocation. Usually for the general atlanta axial dislocation, we fix between C1 and C2. But in patients of basal ventilation, as I, as I said, because there's a C1, a C1 assimilation or the C1 lateral mass assimilated, C1 lateral mass assimilation, so the, the anatomy becomes irregular. In some cases, if, the, if this structure is still large enough to hold a 3.5 millimeter diameter screw, we still manage to put a screw. So we still call this screw a C1 lateral mass screw. But usually, especially in our department, we prefer to use C1, uh, C0 or occiput screw instead of C1 lateral mass screw. So now let's, uh, now let's come to the first controversy. Because our purpose is to reduce the uh, dislocation. So is it, uh, is it necessary to evaluate the, re, uh, the dislocation is reducible or irreducible before surgery by cervical traction? Because many years ago, the, the strategy for the treatment of, of atlanta acid dislocation focus on the reducibility of the dislocation. After cervical traction or skeletal traction and the general, general anesthesia, if the dislocation can be reduced, so we, choose, uh, we, we can choose direct posterior, uh, posterior fusion. But if the dislocation cannot be reduced under the general anesthesia, some authors suggested to first perform transoral release or direct transoral odontoidectomy. And then after that, a posterior fusion. Actually, under general anesthesia, the patients of uh, uh, the uh, more than 60% of patients, uh, C1 uh, Atlanta axial dislocation is irreducible. Now let's see a case, uh, how the strategy changed. Now this is a, a patient of uh, Atlanta axial dislocation uh, with basal ventilation and the general, and the general anesthesia. Uh, and uh, this is cervical traction. Uh, we monitor using the OR. After 30 minutes and about 10, uh, kilograms cervical traction, it seems the dislocation cannot be reduced. So according to the strategy proposed by, uh, um, uh, uh, according to that strategy, we should first perform transoral release and then posterior fixation. But for this patient, we managed to reduce the dislocation direct posteriorly by the facet joint release, posterior facet joint release and the fixation. So 
this is a this is a result after after surgery. We can see the dislocation was completely reduced, and the spinal cord is decompressed completely. So, so our recommendation is that cervical traction is not recommended. Recommended. Uh, recommended to evaluate if the dislocation is reduced or reduced before surgery, neither for selection of a surgical approach, but it is re really helpful for surgical exposure. Yeah. About the intraoperative reduction technique, uh, in, uh, includes two major uh, parts, major procedures. So the first is uh, First joint release, as uh, proposed several years ago by Professor Togu. Now we routinely open the first joint. After a release of the first joint, we put a cage. We put we put a cage inside, and then using the cantilever technique to reduce or to re correct dislocation. This is a technique we use. Uh, today in our department. So this is, this is a strategy. This is our strategy uh, published in the European Spine. Regardless of the dislocation is reducible or irreducible and the general, uh, uh, and the general anesthesia and the cervical traction, regardless is reducible or reducible, we perform direct posterior reduction technique. So now let's come to the uh, let, let's come to the second uh, question. If the face is the joint fusion with or without cage, it is necessary to put a cage in, inside the face of the joint. Of course, our, pur uh, our purpose after, uh, to treat the uh, atlantic exit dislocation is to reduce the dislocation. Of course, uh, uh, the optimal, uh, so the final, so the final outcome should be fusion, the bone fusion. Uh, so we can achieve the bone fusion either between occiput and C2, or directly between facet joints. And uh, oh. Complications in the uh, in the surgery come from usually uh, come from all non-union. For example, Dr. Endo reported seventy-two uh, twenty-seven cases of corneal vertebral junction fusion with follow-up of uh, seven years. The instrumentation related complication is about 30%, including loosening of pedic screw, rod breakage, occipital blade breakage, screw breakage, and pull out of screw. All the complications is related to non-union. Uh, also, Leo reported a more or less the same result, about 7% in occipital cervical fusion and 6.7% uh, at the length of axial fusion, the complication is related to non-union. So now let's see the, uh, let's see the normal situation. We know if uh, the, 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 uh, the gravity center of the head usually Pass, passes downward, cross the condyle, the joint, and the bilateral facet joint. But in patients of a talental exit dislocation, after the re reduction or correction of the dislocation, we can see from here, the facet joint become opened. That means That means the facet joint becomes empty. 
So in this situation, the gravity, the gravity of height passes not through the first joint, instead direct all the force afford on the instru instrument, on the screws, on the road. So the defect of the defect of um, by a mechanical defect is obvious. If we do not put a cage inside the first joint. Now here's an example, uh, the base revolution and the Atlanta Exodus location. In the first time we performed direct reduction technique and bomb fusion on the surface of occiput and C2. It seems to in the first, uh, the first uh, post-operative CT scan, even though not perfect reduction of the dislocation, but it seems the, the decompression is sufficient. Unfortunately, uh, one month after the first surgery, the dislocation uh, uh, reappeared again. So, and the and here we appeared the anterior compression of the spinal cord. So during revision surgery, we opened the face joint and put a cage inside. And put the cage inside. We we got a, a better reduction of the dislocation, and because there's a, a, a and there's a support of the face joint, so the load on the instrumentation becomes very, very small. So this is a MRI scan and a very good decompression. Uh, in the following, in the follow up, we have a good bone fusion. So this is an interoperative image after putting a special designed cage inside the first joint. And this is the case, they put a human electron mass screw in the first surgery, and one month later, the screw breakage. So in the second surgery, we put, uh, we, we put a, a cage inside the first joint. But there's obvious disadvantage of uh, first joint cage insertion. As we know, there's an abundance of venous plexus, and venous plexus in the area. During the exposure of the joint posteriorly, we have to usually uh, we have to coagulate very cautiously of the venous plexus. Otherwise, intraoperative bleeding is inevitable. So. The technique is, uh, so the procedure is technique demanding. Now let's come to the next question. How many degree of, uh, uh, how, how many degree of clairvoyant axial angle should be correct? Because in normal people, we know that the clairvoyant axial angle is about 160 degrees. So it's reasonable to correct the, or to fix a patient's of Atlanta exit dislocation uh, in uh, 160 degrees. It's reasonable in patients of general Atlanta exit dislocation, uh, for example, in, uh, in orthodontoidum. But in patients of business renation, it becomes another question. So should we correct this angle to still to 160? So there's some kind of worthy. Yeah. So for this reason, uh, Dr. Liu from uh, our uh, group performed uh, some study. Uh, 
and the study was based on two basic principles. So the cervical curvature changes serves as a horizontal virtual uh, a visual line. That means the Frankfurt horizontal line. And then the T1 slope is a relatively constant in upper cervical strategy. So based on these two principles, we can, can, uh, we can reduce we can deduce that the change of clio axial angle equals to the change of corpus uh, angle in the cervical in the, in the cervical spine. So this is an example. This is an example. Um, before surgery, before surgery, CXA, and after surgery. So during, during a surgery, the, the CXA, CXA increased about 18 degrees and subaxial cervical doses decreased about 17 degrees. So this is an example. Because as we know, if we fix the uh, uh, face the canal water junction in a hyperflexion. The patient will uh, the patient will have not only the deterioration of the uh, 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 the quality of life, but in, uh, also in some patients, the, in some patients uh, they will have dysphagia. Dysphagia, in very rarely. Immediately after the extubation, the patient will become dyspnea if we have to if we put the patient in hyperflexion of the cranioversal junction. If we fix the the uh, the, the cranioversal junction in a hyperextension situation, the patient will have neck pain. In both situation, both situation will accelerate. Accelerate the subaxial disc degeneration. There are many studies suggest. For example, uh, the patient. This is a patient of C1 C1 C2 dislocation. After surgery, the clive C and axial angle becomes almost 100 degrees. So we can see here the sub uh, subaxial cervical spine becomes kyphotic. And, the, and in this patient, the, actually the preoperatively, the, the CXA was about 101 degrees. And the, uh, and the, the surgeon corrected to this angle to 157 degrees, nearly equal to, to the to that of normal people. So we can see the post-operative cervical kyphosis. So Dr. Liu performed further study for this angle. Uh, he's very clever, he's very clever. He divided the CXA into two parts based on the uh, Chamberlain's line. The upper part Clivers and Chamberlain's lines, Chamberlain's line. Anatomically, anatomically, this angle is fixed. And the the lower part, Chamberlain's line and axial. So this part actually is mobile during surgery, and he and he measured the. He performed many measure, measurements, and the result suggests that the. That the angle of axial tilt, we call this angle, the lower angle is axial tilt, is about 94 degrees in normal people, in normal population. So, our purpose of a correction of CXA to 160 degrees means over correction of axial tilt. So, Consequently, loss of lordosis of, of kyphosis of, of subaxial cervical spine. So correction of 
actual tilt to its normal value is about uh, 94 degrees. So what we focused on, what we should pay attention is to the actual tilt, but not the, not, but not the clive axial uh, angle. Now here's, a, here's an example of the patient. Now preoperatively, the CXE is about 137 degrees. So for this patient, the optimal CXE should be 146 degrees instead of 162 degrees. Now let's come to the transoral release or transoral reduction. Because from, uh, from the exchange with many doctors, uh, which has uh, which have uh, uh, much experience in transoral release or transoral autotectomy. Also from the literature, it seems that transoral release combined with posterior fixation have a very good clinical, clinical outcome. But from the literature, uh, re, uh, we find that, that the transoral release or transoral autotectomy has a much higher rate of a complication, about 11, about 11 percent, 11, uh, 11 uh, about 11 percent in transoral approach, whereas the posterior approach only is about 3.5 percent. So, in our opinion, transoral release can be used as a junctive or salvage technique. Uh, it should not not be as the first option in a majority of uh, surgeons. Now let's come to now now uh, now let's see uh, this patient. Uh, this is a typical image of. Uh, uh, C1 lateral mass, uh, 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 Atlanta exercise dislocation with basin, basin imagination. This is before surgery and this is after surgery. It seems the correction or reduction of the dislocation is not very good. But from the post operative MRI, we can see we've, got, we've gotten a very good decompression of the spinal cord. So for this case, should we perform further surgery to reduce uh, to, to remove the autotoid uh, to, to remove the autotoid process? No. So I suggest to follow up only for this for, for the patient because the symptoms relieved uh, improved after surgery. So this is so this is a our strategy. Even though not completely reduced in the post-operative CT scan, but we use MRI to see if there's enough or sufficient decompression of the spinal cord. If there's if there's still compression, we perform transoral autotoidectomy. Otherwise, we follow up the patients only. So this is our strategy. Now, for example, this is another patient we perform transoral autotoidectomy because, the, because uh, after surgery, there's a very good bone fusion and, uh, and still there's a, a still anterior compression of course, the, the, the surgery was, was performed firstly in other place. So for this patient, we performed transoral odontoidectomy. This is a follow up three years later. So in summary, so the preoperative evaluation of an atlanta axial dislocation is reduced or irreducible by cervical traction is not recommended. And neither selection of surgical approach. 
but self attraction is helpful for, for surgical exposure. So now we do not use the uh, midfield, midfield fixation. Instead, we use the cervical traction. And the intraarticular facet joint fusion is recommended because of its uh, biomechanical advantage. And the correction of axial tilt angle to 94 degrees only, but not, we should focus not on the CXA, but to 80 angle. And then finally, transoral approach can be used as an adjunctive or salvage technique. Autotoidectomy should be performed depending on MRI, but not CT. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zia, for that wonderful presentation. <clears throat> Cranial vertebral junction surgery has to be understood and what you have done, various things you have talked about about the need for facetal distractors, about the need for anterior release, about the need for occipital inclusion, about the need for transoral decompression, and about the need for, uh, you know, about the need for C1 fixation in the presence of assimilation of atlas. So there are various issues that you have discussed and how this fixation can affect the subaxial cervical alignments. So there are many lessons that you have talked about, and I'm sure all those listening to your lecture today will learn and will uh, get several messages. You see, craniovertebral junction surgery has evolved in the last 20, 25 years to a very high level. And in China, there, is, there are many, several groups doing good and advanced surgery. The confusion was started by Dr. Wang when he said transoral release is, a, is an option. So from that, actually, you know, whenever I hear any Chinese presentation, including Dr. Zian's presentation, that anterior transoral release has to be a very important component of the discussion. And I must say that transoral release I have completely abandoned for the last several years. And I never do transoral release or transoral decompression. The other very important message you said about partial reduction following fixation, incomplete reduction, and whether we should do transoral surgery, I completely agree with what you said, that it is not always necessary to do decompression if there is a partial reduction. All in all, Dr. Zian, very nice presentation. I really enjoyed your lecture and thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for a comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting lecture and we had a great learning. Uh, we can take two or three short questions. Our second speaker has already joined. Welcome, Professor Natovich. But uh, we'll go on with the discussion with one or two questions. Yes, Professor Ajitar wants to ask a question. Professor Ajit. Hello, it's a very wonderful uh, lecture regarding the sagittal balance of the cervical spine and its related issues and angles. My question is not related to that. It's just a doubt regarding how will you manage a child with a three-year-old child with a atlanta axial dislocation who is symptomatic and who is progressing with a neurological deficit? This is a very, very good question. As uh, I personally uh, mm -hmm. operated on a, a patients as uh, the minimal age is about five years old, but many uh, other doctors perform even in patients of three years old. Uh, it's, uh, it's possible to put, uh, to put a screw in a C1 lateral mass screw and a C2 pedic screw. It is possible even in, uh, in very young children up to three years old. Let me answer that question also. Yes, Ajit, sir. it is very safely possible. It is mandatory to fix an atlantoaxial dislocation even if it is three-year-old. I have done several children less than one-year-old with C1, C2 fixation. So you cannot leave a child with three-year-old and uh, not do fixation. If it is atlantoaxial instability in a three-year-old or two-year-old or one-year-old, it has to be stabilized. 
And the best way to stabilize is to do lateral mass fixation with screw because the facets are very good even in children. There may be absence of posterior arch of atlas. There may be assimilation of atlas. There can be various anomalies here and various anomalies there, but the facets are strong even in a three-year-old child. So you have to do fixation. And the method of fixation is exactly similar to the method that you, you will use in an adult. In children, the mobility is much more. The, con the joints are much more, you know, the facial articulation is much more supple. So you have to introduce a lot of bone graft and all those things and do a solid fixation. The beauty is you give the child a new life immediately after surgery, new life. So you cannot not do a fixation. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yes, Thank my co-host, Dr. Liu Boon Sen. Like, thanks, uh, thanks, Raja. Thanks, Prof, uh, for the nice uh, uh, presentation. Uh, my question, uh, Prof, uh, in, in your experience, uh, you did uh, tell us that by changing the, uh, the angle uh, and it helped to reduce the same time that because of that, uh, there will be a space between the C1, C2 joint and you put a spacer there. That was uh, proposed by uh, Professor Boyle also. So uh, my question is, uh, how do you decide uh, the degree or the, the, the size of the cage to be used without compromising the basilar artery? Thank you, Professor. Uh, you mean the size of uh, our cage? Yes, right? yes. And how, how safe that you think that the destruction will allow without compromising the basilar artery? Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, we uh, designed the, the cage and we measured, we measured in many patients about, uh, uh, so, but most importantly, it depends on the uh, intraoperative OR. Then we, we release the first joint using uh, special tools, I uh, usually, for, for example, uh, uh, about eight or nine millimeter height to raise the face joint. And then we try to put a, a, a test cage about the same, same size. Uh, so after that, we perform O-arm intraoperative O-arm to see if the dislocation is reduced uh, properly. So we, it's difficult to decide uh, preoperatively the, the the size of the of the cage usually we decide that uh, intraoperatively even though of course we can theoretically calculate the exact degree and the the size of the cage but usually we decide to put it uh, intraoperatively right thank you thank you very much yes uh, Female co-host for today, Dr. Siziao Yang is here. Yes, Dr. Yang. I learned a lot from the, this presentation and uh, I have a question here uh, because there are various uh, implants in these uh, operations. So uh, I, I want to ask, is there any complex uh, infection in this uh, operation? So if uh, in this operation, so if there are in, uh, in, uh, infection happens, uh, so how can you uh, manage it? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, fortunately, we have no patients infected after surgery. Yeah. Thank in you. The, only in the very early, in very uh, uh, early period of uh, uh, of surgery, in the, uh, about ten years ago, we at the time we used many artificial bone grafts. In uh, several cases, there's bone. Uh, the, I, I, I do not think that's infection. It's a problem immune. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think uh, we can wind up this session. A special thanks to Professor Coel and Professor Jian for this wonderful lecture. We had a lot of learning today. I will say a short introduction about our honored Speaker Professor Kenan Arnatovich, who has joined us recently after his departmental meeting. She is a professor at the Department of Neurosurgery, University of Tennessee in Memphis, USA. He is also a consultant neurosurgeon at the Semis Murphy Clinic. 
Professor Arnold as the chairman of the International Program Committee of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, and he's also the second vice president of the WFNS. He's a noted author who has published several articles in various peer-reviewed journals, and we are extremely thankful to Professor Kenan Arnatovich for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at today's webinar. Today is going to talk about cranioorbital pretemporal approach and decompression of optic chiasm, optic nerves, and uh, orbit techniques and visual outcome. Uh, may I invite Professor Akide Kondo to say a short introduction and invite Professor Kenan for his lecture. Hey, uh, great to see you, Dr. Arnav Gaplavik. And uh, we are honored to have him today. And uh, as you all know, that he has contributed to the development of the new surgery with his many publications and uh, clinical works. In particular, he has done a great deal with uh, regard to the scalpels using not just the microscope, but also the endoscope and the, the other type of the typologies. And uh, as already uh, introduced Roger about, about the, the, his talk, and uh, as you may know that the orbital apex is a kind of like a anatomically like a complex places and uh, related to surgery is pretty much the stressful. So hopefully that his lecture will work will uh, take our stories out in the next surgery. Uh, please start your lecture, Dr. Arnav. So good morning, everybody. It is 9, 8, uh, 15 here in Memphis, Tennessee. As you see, I'm working today, unfortunately or fortunately, to our beloved profession. And first of all, I would like to greet everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, uh, first, I would like to thank Professor Yoko Kato and Professor Raja Krishnan Kurti for this kind invitation. I'm really honored to speak here today. And of course, many greetings to my old friends, Professors Bin, Gian, Kondo, and uh, my friend, old friend Atul Goyal, who is a friend for many years. I'm going to talk today about um, um, some pathologies around optic nerves, optic chiasm, and uh, uh, orbit, a uh, little bit neglected part of our skull base, uh, and uh, uh, kind of myth that um, when you lose vision, uh, and when you have significant compression there, there is nothing that can be done in improvement of uh, function. One of the important things that I learned from my mentors is from day one, from the very beginning of first encounter with the patient to document uh, all the findings uh, regarding neuroophthalmologic exam, MRIs, clinical exam, etc., and then follow carefully over the years, have a great neuroophthalmology team with you along with other specialties. Um, I'm going just to say that I do not have any uh, uh, commercial disclosure for these presentations. And I would like just briefly to show you where am I coming from. Um, I am coming from Memphis, Tennessee here in southwest corner of great state of Tennessee in the United States. and. Uh, uh, I'm also uh, uh, proud to be uh, a citizen of the city of three kings, that is city of Martin Luther King, Elvis the King, and B.B. King, and uh, a great city that provided me exceptional opportunity and great career in neurosurgery. Um, our university, and interestingly, in the United States, they always say, oh, everything is very new and there is no history. Well, our university is only 226 years old and our medical school is only 70, uh, 170 years old. So that's interesting. And one of the important things as we always want to mention to other residents and young neurosurgeons in the audience, we need to go to lab, not only during residency and fellowship, but now every uh, opportunity I have, I go to the lab, I study. And when I teach our residents, fellows, young neurosurgeons around the world and in Memphis, I learn every time more when I teach then I, then I give away. It's very interesting phenomenon in education. I like always to acknowledge my many mentors who helped me shape and especially acknowledge my uh, late mentor, Professor Oliveira. And I would like to use this opportunity to send uh, uh, my heartful uh, wishes to our friend and brother, Fred, Professor Fred Gentili in Toronto, who is just recovering from a difficult surgery. And I hope him very quick and speedy recovery. Um, we all know the uh, principles of skull base, and I'm not going to dwell much on them. Um, 
what I want to say also, if I go over the if I go over the time, please just just let me know the time over, and we'll stop and discuss further. So, <clears throat> one of the important things to have in any surgery is to have the proper equipment. So, I would dare uh, any uh, neurosurgeon first, including myself, do not uh, do any surgery if you don't have appropriate equipment. That means a good OR, good equipment. Uh, intraoperative monitoring, uh, intraoperative MRI, if you can afford it, um, uh, neuro navigation, good nurses, circulators, and, and that is one of the essences of any neurosurgery, as we all know. Um, you know, tools are very important. You have to have a good tools. You have to have a good equipment. If you don't have good equipment, you obviously cannot perform it. And then finally, um, uh, Professor Yashagil has given to the world uh, a lot of good equipment, Professor Almefti as well, many other neurosurgeons around the world. And I always, when I go around, I always learn about new tricks and tips and instruments, which I like to use. Um, so cranial orbital pretemporal skull base approach, uh, the modification that I use, and I use several modifications of this approach, includes COZ craniotomy, removal of the roof and lateral wall of the orbit posteriorly, posterior third, posterior half, depending on the pathology, opening of the superior orbital fissure, extra dural removal of the anterior clinoid, opening of the lateral wall of the cavern of sinus, opening of arachnoid cisterns and release of CSF, opening of falciform ligament and mobilizing optic nerves, and finally, longitudinal incision of the tentorium along the third nerve. So briefly, <clears throat> craniotomy, very well known, cosmetic incision behind the hairline, removal of the bone. We published uh, uh, several times this article in the literature, so I'm not gonna dwell very much about it. And then when we go to roof and lateral wall of the orbit, we also uh, um, have to carefully, uh, prior to that, we have to carefully remove the roof and lateral wall, but also we have to have a good tools in our disposition how to tame the bleeding from cavernous sinus. Uh, Ali Krish, my friend, has uh, used uh, uh, injecting of two seal as one of the tools. I find it a little bit cumbersome because it does develop the volume and sometimes the compressive effects into the uh, cavernous sinus with uh, nerve pulses. So I have adopted another technique, which is using of gel foam powder balls, which is a phenomenal way to stop any venous hemostasis, and I use it deliberately. Finally, the removal of uh, extradural clinoid <coughs> has very well been described and modified. And then, and then obviously opening of the complex maze of cisterns around the chiasm, carotid artery, and uh, optic nerves. So um, finally, uh, you know, one of the key steps in this endeavor is opening of the falciform ligament and mobilizing the optic nerves. They were gaining access both inferiorly below the optic nerves, medially, laterally, and superiorly. Once we mobilize the optic nerve, it is released and becomes very loose uh, 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 anatomic structure. And if we carefully dissect it, um, uh, there is not only no risk of damage or worsening of function, but also improvement. So I'm going to show some clinical experience uh, of many, many lesions that I do daily and weekly in my practice. So first is a 58-year-old gentleman who has history of breast and prostate cancer with right-sided visual loss. We have recently published this article and uh, I'm just gonna go straight to the. So here we are uh, using drilling of the uh, basically uh, wall, roof, and the lateral wall of the orbit, and then getting to the anterior clinoid. Here we are dissecting the uh, meningo orbital uh, artery, uh, lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, opening of the superior orbital fissure. Here you can see elements of the cavernous sinus. Uh, here you can see finalizing the removal of the roof, posterior third of the roof and lateral wall of the orbit. 
One of the things you can notice here is dissection of the clinoid. You can notice that I like to use here stitches, which serve as a retractor. Notice that I rarely, if ever, use a retraction. And if I use retraction, I use it only just to hold uh, rather than retract, because really the instruments and position of your view is the way how to address this uh, uh, unobstructed view. Uh, here you can see again opening of the lateral wall of the coronary sinus. One of the other things you can uh, retract mending orbital stump uh, by putting another uh, stitch. And stitches are a great way to, to provide internal uh, uh, retraction while you use extradural uh, dissection. Here is the optic nerve coming into view. I carefully use drill, which is ir irrigated with uh, 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 saline. I use uh, one or two millimeters carison, one millimeter carison and accelerators. And then you can see here, finally, the compression of the optic nerve and completely opening of the uh, optic canal. Um, by the end of surgery, you can see here completely the compressed optic nerve. The tumor here is the inferior uh, tumor that is involving uh, the uh, uh, genu of the carotid artery. Here is the removing of the tumor, as you can see. Uh, it turned out to be metastasis of uh, uh, carcinoma. Here you can see the genu of the carotid artery just below the optic nerve. And here we are now having full anatomy in full display after tumor resection. Uh, <clears throat> this is the result after surgery, and uh, uh, here is the patient whose vision has improved. Now, every case that I'm talking, I have preoperative and postoperative uh, visual fields and complete examination, which starts before surgery and then every uh, postoperatively every three months after surgery. This is another patient uh, with <coughs> no known primary and no known other medical problems who presented with diplopia and eye swelling. You see here the giant tumor of the orbit, not only dislocating the orbit, uh, causing ptosis, uh, double vision, but also uh, severely proptosing the, 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 the uh, uh, eye bulb. Um, this turned out to be plasmocytoma, which uh, we completely resected and, uh, and, and relieved the patient's compression. Here is the lady that we just published recently, 69-year-old lady with previous history of renal cell carcinoma. You see on the right side, um, a complete, uh, almost complete uh, uh, loss of vision. You can see here lower, lower quadrant, complete loss, much of the medial quadrant and the lateral quadrant. There is some very, very patchy uh, 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 re uh, residual. Here is the tumor, here is the intraoperative uh, 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 res, uh, removal and specimen, you can see here involvement of the renal cell cancer into the bone. You can see here some of the pictures of our uh, approach and craniotomy, which we tailored the size of craniotomy based on the uh, approach. It's not one size fits all. We do uh, adjustment based on the location, size of the tumor, etc. So um, just in the interest of time, here is again, uh, the section of the lesion, you can see here orbital roof, lateral wall of the orbits, uh, uh, coagulation of many orbital artery here, uh, cutting uh, of the uh, many orbital artery after coagulation, opening of the lateral wall. And here you can see gel foam powder. It's amazing tool to achieve hemostasis. It conforms to the venous channels that are bleeding and therefore you don't have any uh, excess uh, mass effect, and uh, here is the tumor you can see coming into the view that's uh, causing this uh, terrible visual loss of the patient and uh, uh, dislocation. We combine uh, coagulation here and resection. Here is a decompression of the optic nerve again, and uh, Again, very important thing is to use uh, 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 low, si uh, small size of drill, the drill. I love to use coarse diamond one or two millimeters with uh, constant irrigation attachment 
Um, and uh, here is proceeding with tumor resection. Here is peeling the tumor of the uh, periorbita. Uh, you can use various tools uh, such as Perry's uh, uh, gentle dissection and then gross total resection. Um, here, there was also part of the uh, dura involved by the tumor, which we resected, removed, and here we're closing uh, with dural allograft uh, at the end of surgery. And one of the beautiful things that you can see here, again, uh, you can compare here visual fields before and after surgery. Very soon after surgery, we do have complete uh, uh, regain of the vision, as you can see here with uh, quote unquote gross total resection of the tumor if there is such things in any tumor resection, especially in carcinoma metastasis. Another uh, interesting pathology is a lady with left proptosis. Again, uh, uh, you can see here blindness in the half of the visual field on the left side. You can see here also a part of the uh, medial or nasal visual field that is being involved as well. And you can see a giant tumor involving the uh, lateral wall roof of the orbit. And of course, we knew uh, prior to surgery that this is a variant of meningioma involving the bone. And uh, you can see here, uh, just in the interest of time, uh, this is left side. And you can see here uh, the drill. This is basically, uh, uh, archaeology as uh, 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 as uh, uh, Professor Caldwell, my friend, uh, said once, you just really need to see digging, uh, stay here digging for several hours and slowly dissecting. You, see, you can see here the huge anterior clinoid and the roof and lateral wall of the tumor involved by the orbit. You can see here irrigation, a plenty, plentiful irrigation and uh, long drilling. Um, here you can see slowly, here I, my uh, resident is uh, just protecting the dura, uh, the, the periorbita, and you can see here now the compressing uh, coming to the optic nerve. Here is a combination of uh, usage of one millimeter kerosene as well as uh, uh, irrigation and drilling. Here we are coming to the optic nerve, which is starting to be viewed and nicely exposed. You can see it here, just above, and then the remnant of the tumor below, which you are continuously and slowly decompressing. You can note that the optic nerve is getting healthier and healthier. Uh, it is uh, freed, relieved, and there is really no further pressure on it. And then coming to the to the closure of the case, um, here is uh, again a removal of the final part of the tumor involving the dura, and then uh, patching. Here is the removal of the uh, lateral wall of the cavernous sinus and dura involved by the tumor, and then here you can see the final result coming to the closure. Here is a post-operative, here you can see the post-operative visual fields, complete regaining of the vision on the left side, as you can see here, the patient is very happy. This is her picture. You can see a very good cosmesis. I usually take stitches two weeks after surgery. Um, and you can see uh, after a little initial periorbital swelling, it completely and, uh, uh, recovers and the, 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 the uh, cosmesis is quite satisfactory. And you can see here, gross total resection. Another similar case, a little bit smaller on the right side, uh, same result, uh, same uh, kind of uh, resection and uh, 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 good result, as I said. Let's talk a little bit about clinidal meningiomas. This is a 61-year-old lady with proptosis and visual loss. You can see here again uh, how much visual loss uh, on the right side at preoperative. Uh, visual fields. And again, you know, very important to prove for residents and fellows who want to um, uh, engage in publications in neurosurgery, who want to engage in presentations. Uh, you have to claim, uh, when you claim and when you present your results, you always have 
to show KPS. KPS, of course, picture of the patient. You have to show studies to, to, to substantiate uh, uh, your work and your results. So um, here is the <clears throat> case. Again, uh, this is right side. Uh, here we are opening uh, the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. You see a little oozing, which will easily control with the uh, gel foam powder. Uh, again, in interest of time, let's uh, move along. Here is my internal uh, decompression. Uh, uh, here is uh, now a lateral wall of the cavernous sinus being removed. <clears throat> here you can see opening of the falciform ligament. This is very, very important point. You know, um, I, there are several way, ways to use. One of the ways is to use a sickle knife. The other way is to use scissors. Um, and then, and it's not one size fits all. You cannot say, well, this, this is the way to do it. Some falciform ligaments are a little bit uh, uh, harder and more involved by the, by the tumor. But what really uh, recently I've been doing more and more using um, hook, very blunt one millimeter hook on the top of the optic nerves and opening uh, of the falciform ligament all the way to the, to the orbita. And uh, once you do that, obviously, once you uh, show all the elements of the uh, anatomy in the area and you nicely decompress the tumor, including resection of this last remnants, you can also show the carotid artery and resect the tumor that's here adjacent to the uh, distal ring, and then upon resection, uh, you can also use a little bit of surgical cell or gel foam to make hemostasis. And here is resection of the last part. Here is geno of the carotid artery, resection of the last part of the tumor, uh, of the dura involved by the tumor. Here is the picture of the uh, decompressed orbit optic nerve. You can see complete decompression, tumor is gone. And as I uh, uh, show you here, uh, uh, post-operative result. Another case similar, uh, clinodal meningiomas come in all different sizes and flavors. They are sometimes very small, they are sometimes very large, and the uh, principle is uh, always the same. Uh, you have to take out the tumor, no matter how small or how large, and the, the size of the tumor is re really doesn't make it that difficult. In other words, sometimes the smaller tumors are more difficult and vice versa. Here is another uh, uh, case in the interest of time. Uh, I'm going to skip. This is again lateral wall. These are elements of the cavernous sinus V1, V2. Here is the resection of the tumor. Here is your uh, optic nerve, as you can see it here. Here is again opening of the falciform ligament. And again, as I said, you have to have all equipment at your disposition uh, and uh, use them uh, to carefully uh, open the pulse from ligament. You see how optic nerves is happier here, how it is nicely with glistening surface, uh, preserved uh, uh, um, elements of microperforators, and here coming to the uh, distal, uh, uh, ring of the car uh, carotid artery and also uh, to the falciform ligament. Um, here is optic nerve. You can see completely, completely uh, decompressed. Here is carotid artery. You can see even here is complete anatomy. You can see here everything uh, without the tumor. And uh, here is a patient came to have stitches out. Uh, as I said, uh, these tumors come with different uh, sizes and uh, different flavors. And uh, this is a giant one that presented with occlusion of the carotid artery on the ipsilateral side, complete wrapping of the carotid artery and optic nerve. And here you can see gross total resection with outcome of the optic nerves, uh, the compression of the uh, visual apparatus and uh, gross total resection of the tumor. Another case <clears throat> that I did a couple of years ago in Sarajevo, and uh, I have joint appointment at many universities, and I have unrestricted license to, uh, in addition to United States, a neurosurgery I have in Europe, 
in uh, several countries, and I frequently go and do surgeries. Here is one of the anterior clinoid meningiomas that I've done in Sarajevo, my hometown. And you can see here uh, uh, the preoperative angiogram. You can see the middle cerebral artery on the top of the tumor wrapping and the tumor completely encasing the carotid artery. And this is very, very serious uh, situation which you need to address by dividing the tumor into compartments and then slowly dissecting the tumor uh, of the adventitia of the carotid artery bifurcation, middle cerebral and anterior cerebral artery. Here is the outcome. You can see here that I had a last piece of tumor here stuck to the uh, infundibulum of the pituitary gland, and I could easily uh, I could not dissect it of infundibulum because, as you know, infundibulum does not have a good arachnoidal plane uh, and meningioma kind of gets into the, into the wall. So I had choice to cut the infundibulum and uh, have a gross total resection or leave just this little piece of the tumor and allow a patient to remain uh, uh, free from, from diabetes. This beautiful young lady, about 40 years old, with two kids, uh, family, and her, her outcome was really good. This is uh, another one. Uh, you can see here uh, complete blindness on the right side. Uh, you can see here again the clinoidal meningioma. Uh, uh, completely wrapping around the optic nerve. Uh, carotid artery bifurcation. And you can see here the outcome. Look at this beauty. The patient regained three quarters of her visual fields uh, postoperatively upon uh, resection of the tumor. Another case on the right side, you can see here again um, the tumor. Now, sometimes when you are working around the carotid artery bifurcation, you can have situation where you cannot establish a good plane around the uh, uh, carotid artery and uh, uh, allow the adventitia to be dissected. In this case, I worked uh, maybe eight or nine hours on this case. And at the end of the surgery, at, at 11th or 12th hour, I really um, decided to leave the small piece around the tumor uh, bifurcation of the carotid artery because you know, this is a very important uh, location. And I thought that it's, it's prudent to do it. And it proved me right. This has been done about 11 years ago. And you see that this tumor has been stable ever since. And the patient is completely functional, back to work and doing his uh, activities. Here is another case uh, with uh, giant uh, uh, left-sided uh, um, and in Joma, here is the uh, here is the dissection of the tumor. You see here the tumor uh, has, is being exposed, as you can see here. Uh, very slow dissection, trying to understand very well, very well the tumor, and then uh, starting to debulk it. I find usage of uh, uh, isocool bipolar is very, very important and good for uh, tumor devascularization when you are in the middle of the tumor. But Yashargil bipolars are very, very important uh, uh, during the dissection of the blood vessels around the tumor. Here we are coming now to the bifurcation of middle cerebral arteries. You can see here, uh, middle cerebral artery dissection is very important, as you know, because you can lose patient functionality here. I identify them, cover them with a piece of um, a patty. Here is opening of the final uh, lateral wall and uh, coming to the uh, distal ring. And really, this is painstaking dissection. You can see here the speed of the the speed of the snail, if you will. You see how careful and and slow this dissection is. It takes many many hours of working. And then uh, you can see here I'm identifying now the bifurcation of the carotid artery. Uh, I'm identifying here all the elements and down, as you, as you saw at the, at the beginning, I showed the distal MCA branch is now proximal, and now I'm going to work uh, going proximal to distal, uh, which is the safest way to do it, where uh, you start slowly uh, feeling the tumor of the 
of the uh, car uh, carotid artery and MCA. And you can see here, how long that process is. Here is a middle cerebral artery. You see how Yashargil bi bipolar, uh, Yashargil uh, uh, suction has a nice uh, tip that is atraumatic, which serves as dissecting tool. Here you go. This is the final branch. You see here in middle cerebral artery bifurcation, and I long time thought that this uh, branch is belongs to middle cerebral, but then I realized after long, long dissection that it's going straight to the tumor. So here, I'm uh, when I'm 100% sure that it is uh, going straight to the tumor, I'm finishing the dissection here. And uh, you can see here now complete bifurcation. This is the last part of the tumor. Very important thing is when you have the critical dissection from the middle cerebral bifurcation, you leave it to the end and you make sure that you have very small part of the tumor that is adherent because this is the last branch going into the artery, a, a artery into the tumor. But you want to make sure that a uh, small part of the tumor uh, uh, you are dissecting off uh, the artery because it's very, very important not to have a big mass of avulsing uh, uh, and pulling from the, from the tissue of the tumor. Here is the gross total resection. Here is the outcome of the patient. And you can see here, completely resected tumor. Uh, another uh, case of uh, giant uh, clinoidal meningioma, uh, completely resected, as you can see here. Here, the tumor was so much involving the pericranium that I had to use special uh, cranial graft. Another case, this one is easier uh, tumor. This is intermediate uh, uh, Sphenae wing meningioma, but it did involve the clinoid laterally. So we uh, resected it. And of course, you can see here elevation of the middle cerebral artery over the top of the tumor. You need to understand very well the vasculature before you go to surgery, and you need to slowly and gently dissect the tumor. Another case of a giant tumor, eight years old. The, 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 the age does not matter. Uh, is it 20 years old or eight years old? Uh, of course, it matters that you make sure that patient is fit medically and cardiologically to, to, to have a surgery. But if you do the surgery technically, it does not matter. I mean, you have to do careful job. You need to leave the brain alone. You need to restect the tumor and, and you need to decompress the optic nerve carotid artery and provide best outcome to the tumor, to the patient. Just few cellar, supracellar. This is a tuberculum cell and meningioma, again, compressing the optic nerve. This is the cranial flap. I published this uh, article in Skullbase. Uh, this is just to show you. Uh, I will go here to the, here is dissecting of the tumor of the optic nerve. This is the left optic nerve. Uh, you can see that I'm staying away from the optic nerve for now. As I told you, you have to uh, provide the small part of the tumor to the very end, which you will uh, manipulate around the optic nerve rather than big, big tumor. So the vascularization and the bulking staying three, four millimeters away from the optic nerve. And now you can see here that uh, uh, here is the vascular uh, uh, perforator uh, getting into the tumor being coagulated and then delivering the tumor. Here you can see beautifully the anatomy upon tumor resection, undisturbed uh, uh, optic nerve, nicely decompressed. You can see now complete optic nerve, chiasm, uh, and resection. And, and very important, you know, your patients will ask you, okay, doctor, what's my cosmesis going to be? This beautiful 32 years old uh, came to take stitches. You can see here nothing uh, uh, bad regarding cosmesis. Tuberculosis cell meningioma, another uh, patient that came uh, with significantly altered vision on the right side. Uh, I think I'm coming close to my time, so I will skip. Uh, this is the outcome. This, this particular patient had uh, stable vision postoperatively. 
Uh, another case you can see here, preoperative visual fields, postoperative visual fields, outcome, gross total resection. Uh, another case, this lady is very interesting. And uh, uh, this case is uh, complete blindness for two weeks. I cannot understand this lady was two weeks completely blind before surgery. She came to me. Um, I told her that I cannot guarantee her recovery of the vision. Uh, I have a video, but I don't have time now to go this beautiful demonstration, how even two weeks later, you see the postoperative visual fields on the left side, complete regaining of the, of the vision. On the right side, significant improvement. And you can see the patient, she's able to read and go back. She's accountant in one of the uh, firms about 100 miles north from uh, from um, uh, some other, uh, uh, this is patient operating in a very well-known center by one of the leading neurosurgeons in the United States. And uh, it was very, very, uh, very well uh, uh, decompressed tumor. And they did very good, the, 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 the difficult part of the surgery. But why did they leave this last piece of the tumor on the optic nerve? And why did they not take the clinoid out and decompress the optic nerve? It uh, makes no sense. And this patient had been blind in the left eye, now was worsening uh, in the right eye, now was worsening on the left, in the left eye. And I did the surgery. The good news for me and people who operate here in this area, they, they did not take the clinoid out. So I had a healthy uh, space, uh, uh, healthy uh, plane to dissect that uh, easy part of the tumor. And this is the outcome. Another case I did just this last week, again, the blind. Uh, right eye. I didn't have time to get postoperative uh, image. She's coming to stitches in few few days, but this is the outcome. Craniopharyngiomas. I have whole series of those. Um, uh, also excellent result with with vision and gross total resection. Another one with blurred vision, craniopharyngioma, gross total resection. You see here the preservation of pituitary stalk, pituitary gland gross total resection. Uh, Radkes cleft cysts also can cause optic chiasmal compression and uh, 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 cause the visual problems. It's rare lesion, relatively rare lesion. I have, I have a huge practice of pituitary tumors, but uh, only a handful of them are uh, Radkes cleft cysts that require surgery. And uh, maybe I have out of several hundred of maybe four, three, 400 pituitary tumors, only about 10, 15 Radkes cleft cysts and then pituitary adenomas as a final uh, pathology. You can see here, uh, this is Cushing's disease. I resected this tumor. I use combination of microsurgery and endoscopy to resect the tumors. And only the part of the tumor that has been left is this part that I could not safely resect through the nose. So I went with uh, a pretemporal approach and resected this last part and normalized patient's, uh, patient's uh, hormonal uh, function with Cushing disease. As you know, it's very important, uh, which prolongs the life and the functional outcome of the patient. Um, another pituitary tumor, giant uh, uh, wrapping around the uh, uh, carotid artery and optic nerves. You can see preoperative complete blindness on the left side that recovered at least 50% after surgery. On the right side, uh, also almost complete blindness, recovered substantially. And uh, this lady is a cook in cafeteria in the in one of the high schools. And you can see here, similar situation like that meningioma that I showed you. There was a, a small piece of tumor adjacent to the uh, pituitary stalk. And I always opt for function. And I, I like preserving the patient without DI after surgery, if I can help it. Um, so uh, I'll stop here. I will just uh, conclude with statement that uh, this approach enables radical surgical resection of cellar and juxtacellar lesions. And uh, one thing is they, uh, I hear some of my colleagues at meetings that I attend around the world say, you can always go back and resect more. Remember guys, first time is the best and the only time to achieve quote unquote cure. And uh, it helps preserve the optic nerve, chiasm, orbit, anatomic structures, and in Many, many cases, not 100%, but I will come uh, soon with my large series and outcomes. Uh, many, many cases you can improve the function and even reverse the blindness 
uh, within certain uh, time period. And of course, preserving pituitary gland is almost as equally important as well as pituitary hormonal physiology and cosmesis as well. I thank you again very much for this honor and great opportunity. And, uh, and I will be very happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for uh, your wonderful lecture. And there's so many cases and I'm, I'm just amazing about the, the, your surgery about that. And uh, also oh, we have the uh, question from the chat and uh, do you have any cases uh, treating for the, the optic cyst meningioma? And after that, uh, you get some improvement of the improvement of the, the visual functions about the, the optic cyst meningioma. Can you hear me, Dr. Alnov? Um, are you asking me or you're asking yes, someone? Yes, yes, it is to asking you. Asking you about the, the optic cyst meningioma. What is the recovery after optic cyst? Ah, okay, uh, okay, okay. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a big series. I have just the several cases of optic sheet meningiomas. Um, a, and in these few cases uh, uh, that I had, I know Dr. Almefti, my mentor, had published a series of eight optic sheet meningiomas, and he nicely showed improvement. Um, I, as you saw, I have really, really huge series, but very few cases of optic sheet meningiomas to devote my scientific analysis solely to them. But in both cases, I had a stable postoperative function. In other words, it did not, it did not worsen in these two or three cases. But the, the article that Dr. Mefti has published is about eight cases. This is, by the way, very rare, very rare uh, uh, tumor. Uh, and uh, even people who have substantial number of cases. So as I said, I have limited experience. Many neurosurgeons have very limited experience. But clearly, Dr. Mefti has shown uh, preservation and improvement of function as I did with this other subtypes. Thank you about this. So and uh, you like your access to the anterior cranial process from the, the external dural view. So do you have any like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, idea about the intradural drilling about the, the anterior cranial process? So I have started thinking about extradural uh, clinoidectomy since I was a fellow. And I published uh, now a very, very famous article with Dr. Omefti about paraclinoid aneurysms which uh, we did together and I helped him and assisted and, and, and so forth. And I, I learned during this experience that it's very safe and very easy, even in aneurysm cases, to remove clinoid extradurally. And then I, I, as I was developing my own practice after completion of my study, I realized that it's even much, much easier to develop it uh, for uh, uh, meningiomas, craniopharyngiomas, uh, tumors, uh, metastasis, pituitary tumors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I have yet almost, uh, I wouldn't say never, I had few cases that I had to do intradural completion of resection, but in my hands, extradural dissection of clinoid is feasible in almost 100% of the cases. And I never had a problem or almost never had a problem. Professor Oliveira, late Professor Oliveira, dear and near mentor of mine, uh, he was advocating uh, resection of extradural, but also intradural uh, resection of the anterior clinoid. And he made a very good uh, and appealing case. Um, when you have mastery of anatomy, it really doesn't matter, uh, you know, and I'm never, I tell my residents all the time, don't be dogmatic in neurosurgery. Don't say, I'm only going to do this way. I'm never going to do the other way. You have to be open for reasonable uh, 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 approaches, reasonable options. But one of the important thing is to learn the anatomy as I showed in the lab. Uh, listen, um, another presentation of your experienced partners. You know, I was fortunate to, 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 to be a teacher in uh, Almefti's course and Krish course in neurosurgery for 20 or 30 years. And I cheated in those courses because in those courses I learned more than I taught, you know. Um, from, from uh, all the colleagues, my friends and brothers in neurosurgery, everybody has a little trick to show you. Everybody has a, a way to do it differently. And uh, I would suggest 
master the anatomy and find your way to do it, uh, but do it in a safe way, preserve and improve the function. And then when you claim, when you make a claim, you have to substantiate it both with you know, outcomes with preoperative, postoperative pictures, preoperative, postoperative visual fields, uh, pictures of the patients, etc. Okay, thank you. So I have a just a last question that uh, in your operative videos, you remove that, uh, uh, you remove that uh, almost like a uh, all of the uh, wall of that orbit. I mean that the lateral wall and uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, some type of that uh, you know removing that uh, optic canal and everything. So do you think that you need some reconstruction technique for that orbit? So I there are several modification of cranial orbit to zygomatic approach that I use. There is a lefty approach where you take the roof and lateral wall and and completely remove it and then bring it back together and reconstruct. And I've showed a couple few cases. I showed a few cases of the extended uh, Dolan's approach and maybe Christ approach, if you want to call it, where you resect the posterior wall and lateral wall and roof of the orbit. And um, in that case, when you have a limited posterior decompression of the orbit, I never found a problem in terms of need for reconstruction. In other words, proptosis present preoperatively always retracts and improves. And I never had any exophthalmus or any worsening of things. So um, there were a few cases of orbital tumors where the tumor was involving a, a lot of roof and a lot of lateral wall that we did reconstruct. In the case I reconstruct the periorbita, I don't have any uh, relationship with Stryker. Uh, so this is just my experience. They have a great orbital implant. Which, they, which you order before surgery, they bring the implant to you and then you take it out of the packet sterile orbit. It's made of uh, med pore material. And then you, you use very, very minute dissection and, and measuring and cutting out the, the, the uh, orbital graft and then you can uh, reconstruct if you need. So I very rarely use reconstruction. Uh, with with uh, allograft with 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 med pore implant, sometimes when I think I'll need it, I do the fully blown cranial orbital zygomatic approach with reconstruction with patient's own roof and lateral wall. But in few cases where you have tumor uh, tumor eating up huge parts of the roof and lateral wall, I use this uh, allograft. Thank you. So, do any of you have any questions? Uh, can I ask one question, uh, Chairperson? Yeah, uh, Professor Kanan, it was one of the fantastic lectures, you know, we have heard in this uh, ACNS webinar. It's a just continuation of the question which uh, the Chairperson asked, which I also agree with you that even for paraclinoid aneurysms, most of its project immediately, one can easily do a extradural anterior clinoidectomy. My, my question to you, you nicely showed the importance of uh, not only instruments, your gel form balls, the suction tips, everything you and anatomy, you alluded to very well. My question to you is, uh, you know, uh, extra dural clinoidectomy, all of us do, but you know, those uh, uh, patients who have very much compromised vision, uh, vision is compromised, you know, that any, uh, uh, some people advise them to do intradural clinoidectomy, especially for patients with large tumors who have a very compromised vision. Your thoughts on this, Professor Kedan? Well, first of all, greetings, my friend. I miss seeing you in many you. lectures we do together around the world. And thank, thank you. you. Um, so, um, as I said, I do 95, 99% of the time extradural clinoidectomy. And as I said, I, I don't want to be dogmatic about this. I do it, I show how to do it. I show the result on every patient. I'm documented result of visual fields. One of the important things I think is not technique you use, but the anatomy knowledge, mastery of anatomy, and also these few things that I mentioned. One is hemostasis. You have to do good hemostasis. Uh, because hematoma can always form and compromise uh, after surgery. Number two, 
When you drill the clinoid, you have to use, as I showed, extremely well irrigated uh, uh, drill tip. Uh, throughout the case, as you are drilling with diamond drill, you have to use irrigation that cools off your tip and that uh, makes uh, it safe. You have, to, you have to use very small micro instruments. I showed you, I use, I like to use one millimeter kerosene, never use larger kerosene. It's more a dissecting tool um, and you need to use it very carefully. And uh, as I said, uh, we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to honestly present results, uh, including all these elements of presentation of the results. We cannot just claim I've done 2000 cases and I have, you have to present every case, every every outcome, every visual field. And then we need, uh, but but the, the, the times then when they say that you cannot do anything about the lost vision, I think it's long gone. I think we proved that uh, 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 it's, it's not the case. Now, yes, there is certain amount of time where if you are blind for three months or I don't know how long is the magic number, probably when, when the retinal cells die, you know, probably there is nothing you can do. We still need to figure what is that magic time. But as I showed handful of cases, I had two weeks blindness and I have many more uh, with pituitary tumors and all that. Uh, but we need to, to learn exactly what is the critical time and what is the influence of, of uh, different factors to this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kenan, for your good comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We can ask our first chair, Professor Atul Goel, to give his comments. Yeah, Dr. Kenan, that was a great presentation. To tell you the truth, it was a breath of fresh air after listening to all endoscopy, endoscope based surgery, and endoscopic removal of tuberculum, cellular meningiomas, and all those things. It was quite a you know, it was a happy turnaround. And I completely agree with the kind of approach that you adopted for majority of these tumors. Over the period of time, my orbitozygomatic osteotomies have certainly reduced, even for very complex cavernous sinus tumors and for very, <clears throat> for, my, for several other lesions of the brain. And even my anterior clinoidectomies have reduced over the period of time. Of course, anticlinoidal resection is one of the very important uh, tool to expose the aneurysms and other things. But for meningiomas and, and other things <clears throat> of the skull base of cavernous sinus, my anticlinoidal resection has also reduced over the period of time. So in, all in all, I enjoyed your presentation. You made a very important message of doing several of these cases by skull-based roots. Skull-based surgery and cranial surgery has to survive and thrive, as you have mentioned. So thank you very much, my dear friend. Uh, th thank you, Atul. Miss you too, man. Uh, I hope we'll see you soon somewhere in the world um, and discuss uh, in, a, in a spirited way different things in our surgery. But, um, uh, I completely agree with you. And this also, I'm always thinking about reducing the size and reducing the, um, the and, and all that. And, and as you know, we can discuss one time when we are on panel discussions, what influences does it uh, do to you? How, when do you decide to make a smaller craniotomy? Because one of the things at all that I like is when I open the cranium, when I do craniotomy, as small or as large it is to be uh, in to have intact dura. I'm like religious about it. And I yell at my residents and fellows who help me and who do the approach under my supervision. When they open the dura, they they get, they go to Sam's Murphy jail for two days. Uh, uh, but, but what I'm saying is, 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 so when you, you know how the bone and complex is about, I don't have time to talk about it in the temporal area. And, and, and if you make a very small craniotomy uh, it's also a risk to damage the, the sphenop, uh, sphenop, uh, sphenoidal sinus, venous sinus, and, and also the dura. So th there are some uh, things to consider when you do that. But I agree with you. I did scale down a lot with size of my craniotomy. I do uh, reduce them down, and that's a good question. One, one more comment I'll make about endoscopy, which I use. 
for my pituitary tumors and looking around the corner, but nothing, in my opinion, we have to cultivate microsurgery. The God has given us the art of microsurgery. There is no 2D uh, vision. There is no pulling. There is no a narrow corridor, quote unquote, uh, a, a minimally invasive that can uh, 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 replace the direct dissection. If you have any problem, if you injure, God forbid, the artery, if you injure anything, you can nicely repair it. You can put the clip, you can suture it, you can uh, uh, do, the, the, do the graft, do, do the, do the uh, in the nose, if it happens, you know, uh, I've I, I, I seen some of the things uh, and, and I was very, very scared. And final thing is we have to be honest with results, as I said, Abdul, and you know what I'm talking about. When you, for me, one CSF leak is too many, okay? One CSF is life-threatening and to claim that certain pathologies, it's very acceptable to have 25% of CSF leak and that's very acceptable. And, and, and all showing uh, a lot of neurosurgeons showing destruction of the, of the, uh, para, pa, uh, of the sin, paracellar sinus, para, I mean, sinal, uh, sinuses. Uh, that's a completely new topic. So we can talk and, and, and argue about it at some other meeting. But I just mentioned for a few points. Thank, thank you very much. Hey, thank but, you so much. One question okay. I would like to ask Professor Arnato, which is, uh, when you remove that uh, falciform ligament, there is a chance of a formation of a pseudomeningocele postoperatively. Uh, what is your treatment regarding that? So, so, um, pseudome so pseudomeningocele postoperatively, uh, also, I did not see a, a big problem, uh, maybe one or two cases, which resolves over time. One of the things that I use is there is a fat tissue in many of the patients on the top of the temporalis muscle. It's a good chunk, a good ball of fat tissue that you can put because when you close the dura, you can never uh, do watertight closure. You resect the meningioma that is lateral wall of the cavernous sinus and there is nothing to suture it to. So I, I close the dura the best I can. And then you can always put a piece of fat or a piece of fat and gel foam to obliterate the dead space, which is very important because that dead space that forms at the bottom of the temporalis uh, fossa, temporal fossa, can produce one very dangerous hematoma, epidural hematoma, which is ventral temporal epidural hematoma, which is very difficult to see on CT scan because the cuts are horizontal at the bottom of the, you can see them better if you would do CT scan with coronal projections. So sometimes you can, I saw one or two cases post-operative developed uh, epidural hematoma at the bottom of the temporal lobe, and they show significant uh, clinical deterioration. But you do a CAT scan, and you don't see it very well because the the, the cut of the CT scan go through hematoma. If you, if you understand what I'm saying, so uh, obliteration of that space, that pretemporal subtemporal area is very important with fat, which you can also harvest from the belly area, some gel foam, and closing the dura with grafts of different sizes and different. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, my co-host, Liu Bun Singh, any comments from you? Yeah, thanks, uh, Raja. Uh, thank you, Professor, for a very nice presentation. I have two questions, Professor. Uh, one is, if in cases that already pre-diagnosed tissue, diagnosis of a malignant uh, skull-based tumor, uh, how extensive or what are the philosophy that you apply in terms of uh, nervous tissue decompression? Uh, my, my second question, uh, uh, Professor, you, you did mention about a neural monitoring. May I know that in your cases, how extensive are the visual neural monitoring, including VEP, uh, for uh, third and uh, sixth nerve? Thank you, Professor. So, so I have a, let me start from the second question. I have a great neural monitoring team in my hospital. And, you know, one of the things I have two guys who are really excellent. And, and when you have a good people that you trust, uh, posterior fossa, anterior fossa, wherever you go, you tell them exactly to monitor. What I monitor here, uh, of course, depending on the size of the tumor, depending on the location, depending on the involvement, you want to monitor the third nerve, okay? You want to monitor the sixth nerve, and you want to monitor EEG if you have a giant tumor that is involving the uh, part of the hemisphere, as I showed a few cases. So before surgery, you make a decision, what do you want to monitor in your, your monitor? 
And then the first question you asked, uh, can you repeat, uh, please, uh, what was the first one? Uh, in case that already pre-diagnosed with tissue diagnosis of malignant uh, skull-based tumor, uh, what are the philosophy you apply in terms of a nervous tissue decompression? How so if, if you have, a, if I understand your question, you're asking me if you have, for example, the malignant tumor. Yes, Professor. If you have malignant tumor and you know the diagnosis, so many of the malignant tumors I see turn out to be malignant, but before surgery, you don't know that they are malignant. You know, they have a mass in the, as I saw that plasma cytoma, huge mass, nobody knew. Um, now, yes, you can biopsy, but his vision is going away. So for me, it's easy to, 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 to go to surgery, two hour surgery, take it out and patient goes home tomorrow because it's extradural surgery, like extradural lumbar disc. You remove the disc, patient goes home the same day. Same as with these tumors, you keep him overnight for observation goes home. Uh, so you have to get diagnosis and then you have to quickly decompress because even if the tumor is amenable to radiation or chemotherapy, like for example, plasma cytomas, multiple myelomas are rare tumors, but sometimes happens. You don't have time of one week or two weeks. You are blind waiting for that. So you have to quickly decompress. Uh, to, to give them the best chance to regain vision. But, um, um, you know, if you have a tumor, for example, that is malignant, that is widespread in the skull base, I mean, of course, you're not going to subject the patient to eight-hour surgery to remove 63% of the tumor. I mean, what's the point? Uh, you can yet try radiation. So I have an excellent uh, oncologist in my hospital, people who are experts in uh, 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 radiation oncology also. So we dis discuss every case, we uh, analyze, and of course, I always discuss it with the patient because patient ultimately needs to understand, and they're very smart. No matter uh, their education, they go to internet, they, you show them the images, you show them the anatomy, and they understand pretty much the, and then, you know, you have to make a good discussion with them and see what they want to do. Some of the patients that have malignant tumors say, I'm done, I don't want anything done, and you have to respect it. Some people want to fight, and I think you have to give them the best tool in your hands to allow them to, to, to survive in their fight. So you are their assistant, you are their brother, you are their helper, you are their doctor who wants to give them the best. So it's, it's not, again, one size fits all. I tell all my residents, again, I'll repeat it, don't be dogmatic. It's not like do it one way, do it you have to consider patient age, functional outcome, potential tumor type, extensive involvement, et cetera. A lot of, a lot of things to, to incorporate in your decision. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. We can go back to our chair, Professor Kondo, to hear his concluding remarks. Okay. So thank you for the wonderful lecture. And then as especially about that the question and answer is wonderful for us too. So I'm pretty confident about that the, your lecture today will be the, the useful for our clinical practice tomorrow. Thanks again. So please, Roger, close your uh, close this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I May like I ask one question? Yes. Uh, Professor, Professor Krishnan Kurti. Do you know how many people are watching our, our... There are around 915 people watching live on oh, YouTube, Zoom, and WeChat channel. That's amazing. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, greetings so to much. everybody, I'll my friends. Back. I hope I'll see you. I miss uh, spirited exchange on the podiums and discussing cases and having some uh, uh, glass of drink or coffees together. And I hope this time will come back soon. And all the best to everyone. I'll close this officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yukukat. I would like to sincerely thank both the speakers for today, Professor Fengzhen Jian and Professor Kenan Arnatovich, and both the chairs, Professor Abdul Goel and Professor Akhi De Kondo, for taking out their time. A special thanks to all the distinguished faculties. Professor Suresh Nair, Dr. Abhidasha, and all others who have joined from the rest of the world. A special thanks also to our co-host, Dr. C. Xiao Yang, as well as my dear friend, Dr. Liu Bun Singh, for being here today. So until we all meet on next Wednesday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.